Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's nighttime session. Um, yeah, first we just want to start off this um, forum and discussion by acknowledging that um, all of us are on unceded Aboriginal land. Um, me, myself, I'm on Wurundjeri Willem country of the Eastern Kulin Nations. And so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and all Aboriginal people here today. Um, and yeah, that this is part of a long fight for sovereignty um, and yeah, that the fight against extractivism and mining is very linked with Indigenous struggles. And so this is really exciting that we're here tonight to talk about a call for change, no mining in Latin America, so-called Australia and beyond. Um, and we're also talking about building bridges of solidarity and how we can help each other and our fights against extractivism. So we're really lucky today to have people from um, different, talking about different parts of the world. Um, and to get us kicked off, we're gonna start with Uncle Kev, Uncle Kevin Buzzacott, um, who people have probably heard of before. Um, sorry, I'll just get up my notes so I can introduce you properly. And then we'll be yep. Kevin. <clears throat> and I think we might need to turn off the waiting room. Um, but yeah, so Uncle Kevin Buzzacott is an Arabana elder. Kevin has been fighting to protect his country from the threats of the nuclear industry for decades. Multinational mining giant BHP are the current owners of Olympic Dam that is mining uranium. Um, and so Uncle Kevin has been leading a fight for many d decades against that. Um, Uncle Kevin is the honorary president of the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance, ANFA, people might have heard of. Maybe I'll chuck that link in the chat because ANFA is definitely something to look up. Um, and so, yeah, Uncle Kev, I'll pass over to you when you're ready to talk to us about what's going on in building bridges against extractivism. Thank you. Uh, good to be on here. Uh, it's been a hard, hard struggle and it's still a hard struggle. Uh, BHP, before BHP, it was Western Mining that came into our country. And the, the same old thing, they didn't consult everybody. The, the process was uh, their own uh, gender stuff, you know what I mean? They, and BHP come into it. And uh, there's a lot of other mining companies up around my area. Uh, I can't keep up with them because uh, how they're getting in now is through the native title. So a lot of problems with our families, split people up, make people fight. And uh, the BHP and the government, they're fully supported by the government and also shareholders. Uh, the state government and the federal government and all the mining companies, <clears throat> the shareholders and all other developers, they all... Uh, full bore digging up the country. We, we were always against it from there. Yeah. And uh, they've desecrated uh, a lot of sacred sites. And as you know, the Lake Air Basin, the water from the old basin is pretty sacred. And uh, most, uh, most of those old people that I'm talking about, they're all past now. There's not many of us left that uh, took up this fight with the, with the government and uh, the developers and BHP. Uh, it's hard to get through to them. It's hard to explain to, to them what they're doing. Uh, I've been in and out of court uh, with a few issues. They're still talking about developing uh, the Olympic Dam. They want to take more water out of the lake. And also, they're just killing the mound springs. 
and also other sacred places as well. <clears throat> uh, we have a big blue tell these people not to uh, get caught up with it, don't negotiate with them <clears throat> because you can't negotiate with these people and uh, they're always tricking them with their money and whatnot. And uh, I've been saying it that long now, it's not funny. The people are destroying, we've never destroyed this whole earth. We've looked after it for 40,000 years plus. We've never did any mining and all that other thing that they're working on. Uh, I myself apologize to other countries where our uranium and our water has been used. This is too sacred substance we're talking about here, too sacred material. Uranium is probably the deadliest wars and the killing that it's done in the past with all the Star War games, bombs, depleted weapons and everything. Uh, and also they were talking about dumping waste back up in that area as well. So we got that blue going on as well. Uh, we we all need support in our in our action against these uh, BHP, BHP and other companies, Rio Tinto, Santos, they're the biggest mining companies in the world. That's the biggest uranium mining companies up there in the world. Uh, they don't listen to us. Uh, we haven't got any say. It's all they dismiss our case, uh, and we've been victimised. We've been called criminals and bludgers and whatnot, stopping uh, their movement. And they don't want to listen to us. They're running with it themselves. Uh, the very thing they are killing, the mining companies, the sacred land, the water, and uh, it's the very thing that we need for the future. Uh, money can't save you. Uh, our whole country can, because we've got stories in there. We've got all sorts of... Uh, we can open up the doorway to heal people, you know, teach people understanding, re-educate people about what the whole earth is about. And uh, the way we're treating it now, it's no good. Not as if we got a couple other earths we can jump onto. This is the only one we got and we fail. Humans have failed to look after it properly. And uh, I guess we're always trying to where we coming from. The earth people, the earth, you know. Uh, we've got to stop the They'll end up blowing us all up or killing us all and whatnot. And uh, I don't know what their kids are going to think about them when they find out the whole world's polluted and everything else. So we're going to have to, time's running out. We've got to move quick. We've got to move quick and shut these mob down, get them out of the place. And we've got a few rallies coming up next year and being a bit hard this year in lockdown and uh, can't get over the borders and whatnot. But the BHP and uh, the other mining companies have been locked down. They've been out there uh, uh, flying in there workers and whatnot, they've still been uh, digging up the land, desecrating the old country. Rio Tento over the west did the same, blowing up to our sacred caves and whatnot. And uh, I'm really worried. And I've been telling my people and talking to people about it, that uh, I want these mob gone. they got no right to be there. It's not their land. It's not their earth to to destroy not even the state government's uh, land. It's not even the federal government. They got no right to this country. It uh, belongs to our future. It belongs to the kids. And uh, we want to 
kept the environment safe and clean and clear. The water, the whole basin's copping it, all the mound springs are drying up and uh, what these people that can do, you know. And I'm like everybody else who's got any bad development going on in their country. Uh, there should be a crime against these mob, it's some sort of a war crime where, where if you destroy people and you're destroying their sacred land, they should be charged with war crime, they should be locked up and I don't know what to do with them, but uh, they're no good to us, we don't like them, we don't want them, we want them gone. So I'll pause for a little while there and if you I don't know what else I could say. Um, we all need help. We need support to so we can get rid of them. Bad. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Uncle Kevin. And if you want, I could put the website for the lizard bites back. Do you want me to share that? Yeah, you can do that. We we still because the some of the borders are still a bit closed. We haven't sort of worked out properly, but as soon as everybody's, you know, they've been locked down and all this stuff, and as soon as the virus is gone, we can get people moving again. And uh, we, yeah, that'd be good. What What's the plan for once the borders open up? What are you hoping people will come over and do? Tell us about it. Well, I reckon once everybody, I mean, I'm sure they'd be sick of lock, being locked up. I've been locked up too, like everybody else. And got to get out there. We're missing out on a lot of things. We can't uh, uh, catch up with families and friends. A lot of people have passed away and we can't get to funerals and everything because of their border. And this is the whole crazy thing about it. Uh, the government's... Uh, locking down all these borders. We never have borders, us black fellas. We don't have them borders. We can, and I want to get rid of them, you know. Uh, we free people. This is our land. This is how we live for so long. The way how they eliminate you, you know what I mean? They they stop uh, you from going to Queensland or WA or anywhere else in mass. <coughs> and, uh, uh, but we're not giving in. We've got a few plans and we, we can't tell everybody the plan, but we want people to come along and enjoy it and learn from what we talk about. Please begin some healing process. A lot of people out there are caught up with problems and everything else. And uh, we want to fix people up and uh, we've got a lot Uh, have a yarn, have a little party sort of thing. And uh, it's always the coppers. The coppers are the one that's doing the dirty work for them people. They generally they defect their cars, lock us up and hit us with big fines and whatnot. Uh, Got to get rid of them cops too, I think. We don't want them. Uh, we're not the criminal. The criminals are the bloody people who's doing it. The government and the mining companies. They're the criminals. Okay. And someone's just asked in the chat, when is the anniversary of the Olympic Dam's women demonstration against the mine? I'm not too sure on that, but it must be, I don't know who you could, uh, uh, I'm sure somebody out there must uh, know something about it. Exact, exact time and the date and whatnot. I can't mm. remember. It's been years, biology fell up with all this stuff, but I forget sometimes. Getting too old. That's very fair so. enough. Yeah, well, if anyone here knows or can Google it, <laughs> as we're all attached to the internet, then that would be great. And what um, they'll do. For some, re what for some do reason, it? I. Sorry? Yeah, for some reason, I think it was about 1986 or something, wasn't it? Back then? When the, the the women uh, pushed through the through the line, so there was a, a mass yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
demonstration. So it was uh, pretty amazing. And yeah. because it was women, they had, they had to approach it differently. A lot of the oldies there all passed. There are not many of them left for all things. We did big stuff way back then. Marked and rallied and protests and whatnot. Mm. Uh, it's pretty sad. But uh, the younger generation will keep the fight going. We keep it going until we win. I'm not going to get away with it, no way. Oh. Amazing. Thank you so much. And if anybody has any other questions, feel free to chuck them in the chat. Um, yeah. I've got a message saying you are very inspiring to you, Uncle Kev. So thank you for your work and what you've been same doing you, for so same long. You a lot the same. And we're all <laughs> together. We're all in it together. If you win, I win. If I win, you win. You know what I mean? And we're going to do that. And the yeah. brother there can throw a party for us. <laughs> okay. That's a good plan. Thank you so much. No um, awesome. Well, I think what we have up next is, is a video um, from Sebastian, who's uh, YU from Colombia, um, indigenous to the north of Colombia. And because in Colombia right now it's 3 a.m., so we didn't expect him to get up and talk to us, but we have a video, um, which Murray is gonna help translate for us. So I'll hand over to Lucho, our tech head, to get that video going. Mary, are you ready? Yep. Awesome. Oh, there's no sound. Can anyone else hear it? No. Um, do you need to unmute yourself, Lucha? Or did you remember to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Buenos días a todos. Buenos días, un saludo fraternal desde Colombia, de parte de la Nación Guayú. Quiero agradecer mi participación en este foro eh, de cómo apoyarnos en los pueblos del mundo. Eh, yo parto de que la solidaridad de los pueblos tiene que partir de, de que nosotros partimos de, de un principio que es los valores sociales del mundo. Las políticas públicas que se genere tienen que darse a los pueblos, a los pueblos de bases. Entonces, ¿cómo nos apoyamos? Nos apoyamos de diferentes formas. Good, good day to everyone and warm greetings from Colombia on behalf of the YU Nation. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this forum and um, to look at the way the world's people can support each other. We here work on the basis that social values, uh, we look at the social values of the peoples of the world. And we believe that grassroots communities should be leading in <coughs> the making of policy. Um, how do we support each other? Um, we support each other in different ways. Aquí en Colombia hay ONG a nivel internacional que apoyan a muchas organizaciones a través de talleres acompañamiento jurídico. En el movimiento donde yo estoy, Ousca, Bolsa, Bocuachpa, hemos contado la, con el apoyo de la ONU, con el PNUD, a través de asesoramiento jurídico, asesoramiento de lucha social. Gracias a Dios hemos tenido esa alianza. Y... Uh, here in Colombia, we gain some support um, from NGOs. And uh, my movement has been helped by NGOs with workshops and with legal aid. Um, the United Nations has also helped us in advice with legal aid and on our social struggles. Tenemos la oportunidad. 
oportunidad también de hoy contar con el apoyo de ustedes, de, de otros líderes sociales de Asia, de Oceanía, que para nosotros es un honor. Also, we hope to gain support from you from making partnerships with your parts of the world and um, you as social leaders in Asia and Oceania um, can help us. It's an honor for, for me to be able to do this. Aquí en La Guajira, nosotros en este contexto actual, quiero contarles que estamos pasando muchos procesos que van en contra de nuestros principios como guayú, como indígena. Eh, más allá de las políticas, también nos afecta los fenómenos naturales. En este momento estamos inmersos en una, eh, en una emergencia humanitaria por, por el paso del huracán Iota, donde hay inundaciones por todas partes. Y es ahí donde los amigos del mundo se, se visualizan a través de sus apoyos hacia nosotros. Afortunadamente, a muchos. Here in the Guajira, our current context is that we see many things going against our values and our principles. And, but there's something happening that's beyond politics because we have been terribly affected by a natural phenomenon. We're really facing a humanitarian emergency because Hurricane Iota has caused massive flooding in... <coughs> in our area, on our terrain, and for our people. Organizaciones que hacen presente en la Guajira están haciendo sus labores humanitarios con el pueblo. Pero hay muchas partes de, de mi territorio, del territorio indígena Guayú, que todavía necesitan de solidaridades extranjeras, de solidaridades de amigos del mundo. Y en, este, en, esta, en esta parte, creo que nosotros necesitamos más de esas alianzas internacionales porque estamos atravesando por esa crisis humanitaria. Pero en otro contexto social, político, nos facilitaría mucho que nos trajeran escuelas de pensamiento, de liderazgo. ¿Y qué, puedo, y qué podemos ofrecer nosotros para otros pueblos del mundo? Igual, acompañamiento. En un mundo donde las enfermedades son cada vez más concurrentes, hoy en día Latinoamérica es un poco del COVID-19 y gracias a la sabiduría ancestral de nuestros abuelos, los pueblos indígenas del mundo latinoamericano, hemos sabido recurrirnos a las plantas medicinales para poder subsanar esa emergencia. Our friends across the world could really help us. We need humanitarian aid. Um, in some areas of YU territories, they urgently need overseas aid from our friends because they're really facing a humanitarian crisis as a result of this flooding from the hurricane. We are receiving aid, but many parts of our lands are not. And um, in a social political context, um, another thing I wanted to mention is that would really help us um, if we could learn approaches to leadership. Uh, we, we need to have training in, in how to in schools of thought for leadership. And we want to look at what we can do for other people as well. Um, also accompaniment of our people is a real need for us. But at the moment at this, <coughs> in a context right now, it, there is a serious, Latin America is suffering from COVID-19. And in trying to cater for COVID-19, we have turned to our ancestral wisdom and our ancestors uh, who, our ancestors who um, really, we've been able to use medicinal plants handed down from our ancestors. And in that way, we've been able to heal each other most recently. And uh, we, we, <coughs> we have been able to make alliances with other peoples from other parts of the world. Salud. Y creo que partiendo de eso nosotros podemos afianzar mucho en, entre otros pueblos.
decía un compañero hace más temprano que para lograr nuestro objetivo es la unidad y la unidad parte de eso. One of our, um, we really can make partnerships with other peoples in the world. And one of our comrades said earlier on today, um, the way to reach our objectives is unity, is through coming to unity. Look, go to the Facebook and you go to the. Yes, we need to find unity. De que nosotros nos reconozcamos con otros pueblos, que nosotros reconozcamos que existen otros pueblos que también tienen los mismos principios que nosotros. Entonces, sin más que decirle, quiero agradecerle mi participación. Espero que pueda ser de, de entendimiento, ya que no es fácil este contextualizar muchas cosas de, a través de un video. Quiero enviarles un saludo fraternal desde Colombia, desde la Nación Guayú, hermanos, siempre a la orden aquí. Por si acaso algún día quieran pasar por acá, aquí está la Nación Guayú con los brazos abiertos. Y también... Yes, um, unity means also that we need to recognize other people's identity and we have to recognize their values as well as and see those that share values with us. Uh, to finish up with, I just want to thank you for having me and I hope that we can bring about greater understanding. Um, it's hard to explain our context in a, in a video. Uh, it's hard to explain to you exactly how we live, but um, what I want to do is offer warm greetings from the YU Nation and let you know that our arms are open if ever you want to come to visit us. We hope that we'll have uh, received solidarity and support from you in these very difficult times. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. A todas esas organizaciones que están hoy en día en este foro. Muchas gracias. And I just want to thank all the organizations that are participating in this forum for all your support. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very, thanks a lot for that. And thanks heaps for the translation. That was great. Um, and we have a question in the chat. Is there a website? How, we, how can we get in touch with this group? Um, I think later on, we'll give you some information about how to donate to, 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 to help them in the crisis that they're going through right now with the flood. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about getting involved with LASNET. Um, but I'm not sure if there's any other information, Lucho, that we can chuck in the chat or anything about what's going on there. Not just the one we have in the slides. Okay, yeah, we'll go into some more information about that later. Um, in the Facebook, but, but we don't have it now. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, and I, I just wanted to chuck back to you, Uncle Kev, Uncle Kevin, to see if you have any comments about that or about the kind of building bridges of solidarity against extractivism, if you wanted to say anything. Uh, we gotta, we gotta build it. We gotta keep uh, stick together, like the brass says. Uh, uh, this is a good way. If we can't, this zooming is a good way to link people as well. You know what I mean? But uh, we have to keep up, the, keep together, stick together. Uh, I think I'm going to come out with some stuff down the track. I haven't got it all fully thing yet. And I haven't got all my team with me. They're all scattered. Once we get things together a bit more, we're going to put out more stuff. Email, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, you know. Uh, nah, we have to do it. We have to do it to, you know. 
I don't know whether I answered your question there. I'm a little bit. No, that, 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 that was good. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it is good to know that there will be more information co coming out about how we can support yeah, and get out to. I mean, you, another thing to add more of this too, I guess. Yeah. Add more. And the power of the internet to bring us all together is yeah. pretty incredible. So, um, awesome. And, uh, don't, 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 never, don't underestimate yourself. We, got, we can roll these people. We can roll these government and these people who's doing the bad things to us. We just, it can't happen now, but we can do it in the future. Okay. I might take off in here. Yeah? That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that. It's been great to have you. And I'm sure we'll see you soon. We'll get you on yeah, talking some more. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm? Okay, so next up, um, Ron, are you here? I thought, are you uh, maybe Yes, ready? can you hear me? Yes, yeah, can yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Oh, yeah. Can I see you? Yeah, yeah. This, the ca there's no camera on this computer. I'm out the bush, and uh, <laughs> this computer doesn't have a camera on it. So, so apologies for that. Um, that so is okay. you'll just have to you'll <laughs> just have to not see my uh, beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> we can imagine. Um, um, I'll just I'll just <laughs> give a little introduction about you, and then I'll hand over to you if, if that's all good. Okay. Um, yep. And and thanks for joining us from the bush even though it's a bit trickier out there. Um, so, so yeah, this is Ron Guy, who's about to speak to us. Um, Ron's been involved in, in lots of campaigns, um, helping out with the Timor-Lest um, East Timor fights, um, and also was a, an OHS rep with AWU. Which one's that? I always get my union abbreviation uh, wrong. Yes. Australian, Australian Workers, Workers Union. Union. Yeah, the Australian Workers Union. Thank you. Um, for right, 20 Union. odd years. Um, and Ron's been involved in bringing attention to the Western Sahara, uh, Sahara refugee issue. So involved in kind of arts projects, galleries, attending AGMs <laughs> for the Western Sahara re resource um, and share, shareholder activism. Um, and so, and Ron, feel free to correct anything that I've said. <laughs> um, and yeah, tonight we're just talking about um, building bridges of solidarity and, and how to help each other fight extractivism. So it'd be great to hear about what you've been up to and the context and yeah, how we can build bridges with these fights against extractivism. Thank you. Yep, okay. Well, I guess, I guess one of the biggest examples is the fact that we're actually talking on on the issues of, of resources um, here in Australia. So the, the Australian companies that uh, do mining all over the place and connected, um, whereas the the Indigenous populations don't have much of a say about the, the issue here, um, Western Sahara being one of them, and their resources have been um, ripped off by the the uh, Mor Moroccan uh, absolute monarchy, um, and that was phosphate in that particular case. So, so they're stealing the phosphate uh, from the West Saharans um, and not having their their choice uh, over what happens to them, which is against the United Nations ruling on on uh, resources. So they have to have the consent of the ind indigenous population. Um, and their knowledge, um, and I guess that uh, goes across all uh, indigenous populations. Um, and we've been quite quite uh, successful here in Australia by bringing in attention to the superannuation funds, and uh, at the AGMs, bringing in attention to the uh, to the industries involved. And uh, probably the the best uh, success was with uh, uh, West Farmers which uh, was importing phosphate into Perth and then fertilize, using it as a fertiliser across the, the wheat fields of uh, Western Australia. And they, to start off with, didn't, um, uh, were, weren't acknowledging the issue. 
but then after us attending the AGMs and uh, talking to all the other shareholders and to talking to the superannuation funds, talking to the uh, unions about it, um, eventually they started um, in their annual reports saying there's nothing to see here, we're not doing anything wrong by the UN. And then uh, a couple of years later, they're talking to us uh, quietly and uh, saying we can't find any other way of uh, of, of um, adding this resource. And then eventually they found other ways of, um, of improving their equipment so they weren't reliant on Western Saharan phosphate and they haven't imported since, uh, since what's uh, 2012, I think it was the last one. And uh, we've done a similar campaign with Incitec Pivot in uh, in Victoria, which supplies phosphate for the uh, for the Eastern Bloc. Um, and now the campaign has shifted to New Zealand, and at the moment uh, there's a there's been a a blockade by activists to try and stop the ships. There was a flotilla of of uh, students went out in the boat to try and stop the ship from coming in. So that was about six months ago um, and the the cooperatives over there are saying oh we can't get it from anywhere else we're doing nothing wrong under the UN so hopefully it follows the the process that happened into in Australia and that removes the the, uh, the wealth of the extraction going to the the, to the country that's invaded uh, Western Sahara, being Morocco, and if it affects their purse, well, then hopefully that will change the outcome of that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, so this is only uh, about 10 days ago, or I think uh, in uh, the 13th of November, um, actually war has started again in, in Western Sahara, um, in the control zone and Western Sahara had a ceasefire with Morocco, which in, in since 1991, and it was on the 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 uh, the, the outcome was there was a, supposed to be a vote of self determination. So it's the last colony in in Africa, Spanish colony. So Spain should take uh, should take control of that, like Portugal should have taken control or eventually did uh, over the vote of self-determination by Timor-Leste. So Spain needs to step up to the to the plate and do the same thing. The difference with Western Sahara is that it hasn't given up its arms and that was part of the uh, the ceasefire. So they're still armed. The Probably the bad part is that Morocco's had 20 odd years to, to uh, uh, build up its defences it's laid something like 10 million landmines along the the uh, occupied zone and as we speak uh, today uh, the people inside uh, the controlled area by Morocco uh, there's been family invasions so they've gone in and, and um, beaten beaten uh, women old women activists in there and they're uh, trying to break the spirit of the West Saharans about their independence struggle. Um, so I guess in Australia, it would be good if this conference could put up a, uh, a motion of support for the struggles of the indigenous population of Western Sahara. I sent, I sent a copy to, to Lujo to send, to send around to try and get some uh, uh, consensus of uh, uh, change it if you if you like, but to try and get some support uh, to send out uh, to the to the people in their struggle at the moment. Uh, the on West Saharan side, probably the positives are that uh, the refu the refugees are actually in Algeria. They've had to escape and set up camps around uh, water uh, drilling areas. So there's four major camps. Of refugees in the in the in uh, the bottom end of Algeria, and uh, they've been mainly run by the women, and the uh, they're they're in the government. They're a Sunni nation, which is the same as the Moroccans are Sunni as well, the majority of, and the women have uh, uh, control over the the over the food source. The uh, they're active in the 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 government, the whole, uh, and they've actually, they're, they're training as we speak, um, which they had before. Um, 
and they're highly educated. They've got something like 95% literacy rate, according to the UN, and they've achieved that in their years of, uh, of uh, isolation in the refugee camps, living on um, uh, very minimal uh, food supply. At the, uh, the last report was uh, that the, the people there, the, the UN recommendation is that you have 20 litres of water per person uh, per day. Uh, they have been existing on eight and 12 litres of water. So that doesn't leave a lot to, to spare, um, but they're well-educated. Uh, 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 a lot of them got education in Cuba as far as doctors and teachers and the works. So they've all come back, a lot of them come back to the camps. Um, so in essence, they're in full, full war. But what did happen on the, the United Nations have failed them. And what happened was that uh, in between the border, that down between Morocco and Mauritania, the UN were controlling that area down there. And Morocco started using it as a transport line. So the West Saharan women and uh, civilians went there and blockade, did a peaceful assembly blockade to stop trucks from moving back and forward there which is their right because it's their land and the UN should have been uh, stopping that from happening. Morocco sent down its uh, military uh, to start uh, 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 to clear the people away and uh, the Polisario sent their army in to protect the uh, population. So that's, uh, so they're now back at war, which changes, changes a lot of, um, and we've just been, because it's so recently happened, we're just trying to analyze the changes that it will have had. And uh, I guess one is uh, that does highlight the trade that goes on with, um, uh, with uh, the Western world and uh, uh, materials from that area. And one of the, the issues that was brought up was the fact that uh, in South Australia, I think about two years ago, the Moroccan government came and did a deal with a couple of meat working companies there uh, to supply meat to the uh, the soldiers, the Moroccan army. So in essence, South Australia is feeding the army of uh, Morocco that are, uh, that are um, uh, committing crimes against the Western Saharan indigenous population. Um, so maybe that's one of our areas for bringing attention to that in the future. Um, the other issues that have been happening there with resources in Western Sahara is one is the sands even are being stolen and taken across and put on the Canary Islands. So Spain, Canary Islands is controlled by Spain and uh, that has something like 13 million uh, uh, visitors enjoying the beach, the sand of, uh, of the West Saharans. So there's been resource theft there. Another resource theft was the, uh, the fisheries that uh, the EU were taking. Um, Spain was doing contracts with the Moroccan government over the fisheries. And it's one of those unique fisheries where the hot stream meets the cold stream and, and there's just the multitude of, of sea life. So uh, it, it was being stripped by, by the fishing uh, of, from Spain and from Ireland. The, uh, Mor uh, the Polisario took it to the EU court one and one twice over the argument. The first time the EU were trying to put forward the argument that in the future, the ownership will be sorted out. So it's okay to exploit their fisheries, which uh, fortunately got challenged. And then that got, uh, uh, that ruling was turned over. And so that uh, to do, to do business with uh, Western Sahara material without the permission of the Western Saharans is illegal uh, during the, in the world. Now, um, uh, the free trade agreements that have been entered into, uh, America set up a free trade with Morocco and because of, uh, ironically, some of the senators down there, and this is Republican senators, which we usually probably coming from our political background, we probably don't support very much, but they uh, have challenged what's what's uh, happening there. And the, the, uh, the free trade agreement 
between America and Morocco ended up with a paragraph in there saying that the free trade agreement did not recognize materials from Western Sahara. So not even America recognizes Morocco's uh, control over this area. Another fight, part of the fight and campaign that was going, is going on because of the geo uh, landscape of that region, um, there's a lot of oil and gas off the coast, which of course uh, uh, companies are interested in. And, and the political game that got played out with that was that Morocco uh, uh, penciled off areas and asked people to uh, ask the, um, the total fin uh, Kerr McGee, big mining, uh, big oil drilling mining companies, to uh, to to, to uh, search for oil and gas off the coast there. So they were doing some drilling off the coast, and the Polisario set up a counter uh, contract. So they contracted out to a couple of Australian companies, uh, small companies, and they said, "Well, uh, we'll." We're the, we're the official owners of this. We'll get signed a contract with you that says that uh, uh, that you've got mining rights over that, that area uh, when the vote of self-determination is held. Now, that, those small companies took the big companies to court because the arrogance of the Kermagee and Total Fin, or Kermagee especially, was to keep drilling off the coast and one of the, the their CEO of that company, their attitude was, well, let the Polisario send out their five or six fishing boats to try and stop us from drilling. Now, uh, the world uh, financial companies, uh, one, uh, um, uh, the Norwegian super fund, uh, they said to Kermagee, if you're going to do that, we don't recognise Western the, the the control over that area, and you shouldn't be drilling there. We're going to pull out from uh, our investments, um, I don't know whether it was ten billion euros or such, but that changed the attitude of the CEO of Kermagee when all of a sudden these pension funds um, started pulling out, which I guess puts into play something that we should be looking at. Um, is that in Australia, all of the people that are listening today uh, on this uh, have got superannuation funds, whether they're in the industry fund or whether they're in other funds, we've all got an investment in uh, uh, the ethical uh, uh, ESG, the ethical sustainable guarantee super funds. So we need to start using that as a, as a lobby uh, to change um, our, our attitude to the, the our uh, superannuation's attitude and bring to attention at the AGMs, at, to our superannuation funds, and we have got more strength in numbers uh, to get them to be become more ethical with all of the uh, different different issues that have been discussed over this IMARC um, anti-conference that we've had, uh, a lot of them come back to that that basis. And, you know, we've got the strength to go picket things. Um, we've got the strength to uh, do other, uh, you know, to, do other campaigns, but that should be just one of the strings to our bow of where we should be moving our um, effort. And to give another example of what happened over in Spain, because Spain, uh, was being uh, the other the other resource that's being drained from there is the uh, artesian water, which there's limited in the Sahara Desert, and that's being sucked. It was being sucked up and was being used in uh, 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 these large tomato factories uh, producing tomatoes, which were being supplied on the shelves of the Spanish supermarkets. And what they did there was a campaign. Um, to fill up their shopping trolleys with the tomato tins of tomatoes, and they'd uh, one person in a shopping centre would start up a song, and not that I speak Spanish, unfortunately, but it was in Spain saying, "Oh, what have we got here? The tomatoes." So it was quite a, a good YouTube uh, singing singing uh, effort, 
and the guards would come come out to try and quiet them down and then somebody else from another end with the shopping stuff would start singing again so all of this was put on the on the on facebook and went around and everybody was singing and then they got to the to the checkout and just left the shopping trolleys full of the tomato cans saying i can't be part of human rights abuses uh you know the, the ethical issues blah blah so eventually the company the, the shopping company stopped putting uh, these supplies on the shelves now there's an australian company uh costa one more Geelong. minute run one more minute okay i'll just finish on i'll finish on that note there's an australian company costa which has taken up a joint venture in morocco um supplying strawberries and i don't know what its workforce is like but it's on the share market i don't know how they treat their workers but uh i, if, uh, I can imagine it can be badly but maybe that gives us uh, an opportunity to research that a bit further and see what products are coming from morocco onto the show at supermarket shelves and doing a campaign of one of the uh, supermarkets down in uh, the cost of supermarkets down in geelong so i'll finish on that note Thanks so much, Ron. And that's a great note to finish on. I love the creative action, um, getting more singing. We can get Marisol, who's a good singer, to come in and do some creative singing actions with us. I really love that. <laughs> Anissa. Well, we could we could do we could do that for any we could do that for a, a lot of the different products. So maybe we've mm. got to put our thinking heads on of where to to who to. Yeah, no, that, that's so good. Um, and I also really liked when you were talking, I think you brought up a lot of opportunities of how we can um, build bridges and some of the bridges that already exist. Like I, I did really like the mentioning of kind of in Cuba, how often they provide a lot of education and, and doctors. So there's, you know, one very concrete bridge that exists and also the kind of work that you've been doing. And I guess other people around the, the world and kind of the AGMs of these companies and um, as shareholders um, and all, all of that, it's kind of bridges across countries that, as you've said, you know, can make a difference. So thanks, thanks heaps for that. Um, and if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to chuck them in the chat. Um, but for now, I might move on to our next speaker. Foro Bibi, are you here? Are you with us? Hello, I'm here. Yes, thank Hello. you. Hello. Good to have you on. Um, yes. So, yes. Yeah. yeah, good to see you. Okay, I'll quickly introduce you for those who haven't had the pleasure of hearing from Poro yet this week. Um, Poro is a NAM based West Papuan human rights activist. His involvement in advocacy work mobilizes community, intersecting between creative, cre creatives, community development, and community organizing. And I can definitely attest to that. I watch the work that Poro does here in um, bringing community together and building bridges. So yeah, Poro, if you could tell us a, a bit about what you're working on and kind of how we can build bridges. Yeah, your ideas of how we can build bridges um, of solidarity and help each other fight against extractivism. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, firstly, I wanna, uh, Acknowledge the stand um yeah the the land I'm standing on at the moment um the Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nation and Bunburi people of the Kulin Nations uh, the place where I amplify West Papua struggle um yeah and thank you so much for this opportunity and yes uh maybe before we uh, go forward further to like can I ask how much how much time do I have um about. 10, 15 minutes, I think. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. And yeah, uh, I would like to start to tell everybody out there in uh, the audience that um, what actually happening in West Papua and like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start share screen and explain a bit the, uh, the extractivism activities that are happening in the whole uh, West Papua land. Uh, uh, do you mind if I share my screen? And uh, I think you need to make Poro a co-host. Um, yep, go for it. Sweet, thank you so much. Um, 
Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Um, can everybody see the screen with me? Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. So a bit about this um, amazing map at the moment you see on your screen. It's the the master plan of the uh, expansions of of industrial um, development in Indonesia. And for this particularly is from the easternmost part of the Indonesia, which call uh, Maluku and um, West Papua. So as you can see on a picture there, um, the main goal to uh, boost the development and economic growth is through uh, this points right over here on this legends, which is, um, First come first, which is food agriculture, and here is uh, palm industry. So uh, they have a, a national project called MIFE, uh, Morocco Integrated Food, um, uh, Morocco Integrated Food and Energy Estates here, which is mostly uh, run by uh, international investor, uh, palm industries companies and also, yeah, it's it's right over here. Um, you can see on the map, it's right here. So pretty much it's gonna be like more than 1 million hectare. Uh, the indigenous Meroki people, which is uh, some of them called the Mahuse, uh, land that has been taken away from them and uh, supple, supple food, which is uh, the sago has been destroyed and cutting down. Um, in the name of economic growth and also for palm uh, oil farms. And yeah, that's in this uh, southern part of West Papua. And if you go up to the central part bit here, so yellow in the legend means copper mining activity node, which is uh, in here we have uh, Freeport McMoran, the famous Freeport McMoran, um, one of the biggest gold and copper company in the world. Uh, owned by the US. And also you go further up here. This is uh, Teluk Bintuni, the Bintuni um, coast. And also go further up here is Sorong. And two of them uh, indicate that uh, they, these two area is rich of oil and gas. And also, yeah, so pretty much the, this uh, corridor map which is the major, major uh, road construction that uh, has been planned by the Indonesia to connecting all these, you know, um, different, different, different uh, mining and palm oil industry in, in West Papua. And in here, you can see this, um, the big road connecting um, north to south where West Papua here uh, where they're gonna build a lot of um, army base as well. So uh, all West Papua indigenous who fled from, who, who, who trying to run away from their the land because of military brutality and oppressions to Papua New Guinea cannot go. So yeah, so pretty much uh, if you can see in this, the whole West Papua map here, it, it's, a, it's a land of extractivism everywhere. And also, yes, um, in here, uh, I, me and a couple of friends, we had a little project uh, connecting, we make a map of uh, the military presence and military base, uh, especially T T TNI, the Indonesian National uh, Army, and uh, Polri, the Indonesian National Police, based in West Papua, which is really, really, really uh, close to where the, um, the mine sites are and the palm oil industries are and really close to the Masaki's location. So in here, uh, you can see um, in just two years, uh, it's been reported by our friends in um, Tapol do Oak from, uh, uh, Tapol means a political prisoner in Papun Malai. So during the last two years, there are more than like 243 victims, including children actually has been murdered in this area here called Nduga, uh, where they're actually trying to build this major road constructions to connect, yeah, again, all these different big industries. 
everyone. And you can see up in Wasio where the oil and gas uh, reservoir, the the the, part, the West Papuan province with the part of West Papuan which which has rich oil and gas um, reservoir here. There's another massacre in Wasio and then uh, in Biak Island here and also Jaipura, which is the capital city, so on and so forth. So, and yeah, in here, um, yeah, during during the whole, the last 50 years, um, what I can see is that like, this is reported by Saturday paper, like Australian famous, uh, one of the Australian famous um, articles, magazines, and, it's been reported that during during the raid, uh, in during the raid in in the area close to the major road construction, there is there is a use of using uh, there is a use of chemical weapons dropped to the indigenous village there in Duga. Um, uh, they call it uh, what do you call it? Uh, white phosphorus. They use the white phosphorus to the to the villages there, and then they they flat for about three days. Um, to the seeking asylum to the closest uh, uh, regions, which is around this area. So this happens last year. So this uh, expansions and development of uh, Indonesian economic economic uh, growth. The, the, this master plan. Um, I forget. I was about to say. Um, this is for the period of 2011 to 2025. So at the moment, they're still underground this major uh, uh, project in Indonesia and in West Papua too. So uh, last year with the, the raising of uh, student movement in Indonesia, which is the, uh, close to the end of um, 2019, where um, more, more than 580 uh, students nationally uh, actually supporting West Papua, the motions of West Papua self-determinations and also um, to fight against uh, uh, racism because what's happening to the students in uh, our students in Jaffa uh, has been called dogs and monkey go back to your islands and then suddenly the whole movement uh, fire up and yeah same as in, in, in West Papua as well and and then they the Indonesia, the, the Jakarta, the central government sent like more than 5,000 troops to West Papua and shut down the whole communication line. And um, yeah, it, it, so most of the most of the military presence there, it, it's 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 everywhere, and it's they are still there. They haven't been pulled back to Jaffa, and there's still a lot of um, underground military operations going on especially on the sorry especially on the high high uh, highest in the highlands regions of west papua here and sadly that um every expansions and yeah ex, every major ex, ex, ex every contract contract for expansions of the of the mining side for example in freeport like now they start doing underground um yeah, underground pit, no open pit, start to close open pit. It, it, the agreement, the contract made by the Indonesian elitists, like in here, you can see contract to be extended to 2041, but those people who actually make this um, agreement is people like, people like Luhut Panjaitan, which is, um, has, you know, like a really, really, um, I don't know. For me, a really, really rich background. You know, come from um, come from a, a army four-star army general, who now um, go to uh, what do you call it? Yeah, join, join, go to the political world, and then trying to get more power and control. So this is one example, and also uh, especially for BP, BP LNG. Um, they have an expansion as well. And in here you can see that, oh yeah, the approval was announced. This is from official BP uh, website. Uh, announced that today UK Prime Minister David Cameron in London and 
Uh, also, the Indonesian president, uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, approved for the train tree uh, uh, Tangu plans. So just just so everyone know, like BP Asia Pacific, the reservoir is in um, Tangu, West Papua, and yeah. So like with this presence of yeah, this is Freeport. I think I showed you, uh, everyone during the previous presentation. This is Freeport, and the location of Freeport is actually on on the highest region in Australasia uh, plates like between Asia and Australia this is the highest point on earth and then here we have snow like we have snow the local people call it salgio body the eternal snow so can you imagine mm. tropical paradise tropical paradise with the snow mountain is the only yeah in Pacific the only the one and only in West Papua where they build this massive um, billion dollars mine gold and copper mines and in here you can see yeah uh there's so much injustice happening to the mine workers there uh underpaid uh also um what do you call it uh this is this is a photo during a covid where they cannot go back to see their families while they need to work the whole time so they 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 do a blockade uh, underground pit in 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 freeport and they do protests. Ooh, um, why am I disabled to share my screen, Lucho? Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yes. And then this is this is this is the BP. So you can see it's like it, it, the 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 statistics say 3.8 million tons per annum, while in West Papua there's still some rural regions that. Don't have access to clean water and uh, gas or oil or fuel or you know all these different um, oil and gas products. There's still some of the community in village don't have access to it, and yeah. And here they have a ICBS project where they use the local to work as a security to protect them. To fight against the local as well, definitely. And one more minute, Bora. Yeah, so on, so forth. Like for me, for me, like yeah, there are heaps of UN and any other uh, international community who want to come and see this injustice happening in West Papua, but it's been blocked. Like here, even UN representative come to West Papua has been denied by Joko Widodo himself, and also there is, um, what do you call it, uh, New Zealand diplomats want to come. To meet West Papuan people, to as an observer of this human rights violations happening in West Papua has been denied. So for me, the bridging, the bridging that we need to do between all of each other, the same scenario, like the same scenario happening to the indigenous people in South America, in Africa, in Middle East, due to oil and gas, due to extractivism. So we, uh, like for me, to have a, uh, to have, to have um. This platform, like IMAC, where we can connect, and you know, building solidarity, you know, sharing sharing our struggle stories, story of oppressions, and um, it's good. It's good in a way that um, this story, this story had never been heard before, never been heard before, and yeah, to create the platform for indigenous people to share the story, it's 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 highly valuable because um, at the end. Uh, the practice of like indigenous culture to to the land itself will benefiting all of us who live under the same um, ozone layer, you know, like uh, yeah. So that that's that's I can simply say it to 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 respond to the questions. How can we bridge? And we need to have a conversation on um, how can all this open pit. Uh, and, and and tailings that has been left behind, like in Bougainville, like how can Rio Tinto be be responsible to do clean up, you know, to be responsible to the community there because it's not just contract finish and then you left the you left the land and then that's it. Well, you know, the community still live here. You know, community need the water here. Community need the plantations here. Community needs everything here. So. 
yeah, how can we have that conversation for this big, massive company to be responsible to what they leave behind? Because it's just, a, it's, it, it, it's not a matter of uh, economic growth, it's a matter of life and the life of the indigenous community everywhere in the world. Um, uh, yeah, and thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Poro Vivi. That was, yeah. Can I, so, uh, can I add something? Yeah, please. Yeah, so 1st December is coming too, coming soon, mm. which is next Tuesday, uh, which is, um, we commemorate, commemorate as a, uh, our flag racing, International Flag Racing Day. So yeah, I would like, I would like to invite everybody out there who watching this to, to, Take a, take a photo or send your solidarity email, message, text to support emotions of self-determination to West Papua State struggle. So don't forget to take a little photo with uh, our morning star flags. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. And could you put any like links in the chat for people and we can add it to the Facebook video um, so people can see how to get involved, where to send their photos to. Um, and all of that, because yeah, that's a really good example of a building bridge and solidarity showing that we can do next week. Um, so I encourage everyone to do that. Um, and yeah, Peter just checked in the chat, a bunch of us will be in Edinburgh Gardens on Sunday, you know, after a week of online, <laughs> well, some of us will actually get together so we can take some photos there, which would be really, really good. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Poro, for yeah, telling us all of everything that, well, not everything, I'm sure that's only a small part of what's happening in West Papua. Um, and yeah, it is really exciting to have this platform so people can learn about what's happening in, in um, all over the world and the similarities that these mining co companies are doing, which are meeting in IMARC this week and in the International Mining and Resources co Conference this week. And hopefully there'll also be a lot of people, um, yeah, in so-called Australia that will go away understanding more about what these mining companies are doing so that we can denounce and spread the word and all of that. So thank you so much. Um, and I think now, oh yeah, um, we're gonna go to a video. Um, it's getting to quarter past nine. So thank you so much for everyone hanging around. Um, well, quarter past nine where I am. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll have a little video um, it's a animated, it's an animation. Um, it's produced by communities in Ecuador and it's about extractivism in Latin America and the world. Um, and some subtitles have been put on. So thanks so much Lucho for doing all of that work. Um, it goes for about six, seven minutes. It was made this year. Uh, oh, and thanks Poro for putting the flag raising in the chat. Um, so yeah, Lucho, if you could show us a video and then we're gonna come back and we still have to hear from the amazing Marisol, who will hopefully sing me another song um, and then tell us all about the horrible extractivism in Latin America and the amazing r resistance of the Mapuche and other people and the bridges we can build. So stick around for Marisol and here is the video. Thanks, Lucho. You gotta unmute yourself. We can't hear it. I can't, can anyone else hear it? Marisol, you need to... Uh... Oh. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, he's, he's getting ready, he's getting ready. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, good. It's a beautiful background. The lion. Awesome, thank you. Imagina que tú y tu familia viven en un lugar lleno de vida, con bosques nativos y nacimientos de agua pura. El día a día lo pasan entre la siembra, el pastoreo de animales y en el río pescando. Y así han vivido felices de generación en generación. 
Ahora, imagina que un día llegan unas personas que se presentan como expertos de una empresa y del gobierno a informarles que en su territorio implementarán un proyecto de aprovechamiento de recursos muy importantes para el desarrollo y la economía de la región. Les insisten en que esto traerá empleo, educación, hospitales y sobre todo mucho dinero. A ustedes les da desconfianza que ellos vean la naturaleza como un simple recurso que debe ser explotado. En poco tiempo comienzan a hacer reuniones informativas con palabras raras y técnicas minimizando los impactos del proyecto. Parece que no les importará lo que ustedes piensan. Tú sospechas que estas reuniones son simples requisitos legales y que por esto les hacen firmar actas de asistencia. Además, organizan fiestas, les ofrecen regalos y así se van ganando la confianza de la gente. Por si esto no fuera poco, te das cuenta de que le han dado dinero a algunas personas para que apoyen el proyecto. Así es que en un abrir y cerrar de ojos lograron dividir a tu comunidad. Tú decides irte hasta la ciudad para preguntar en las entidades del gobierno por qué el proyecto tiene todos los permisos pasando por encima de la voluntad de la comunidad. En vez de darte respuestas claras, te envían de una entidad a la otra y luego a la otra. Te aseguran que el proyecto cumple con todos los requisitos exigidos por la ley. Entonces te preguntas, si la participación y las consultas son un derecho de las comunidades, ¿por qué en la práctica se convierten en un simple requisito legal que termina favoreciendo a los megaproyectos y no es tenida en cuenta la voluntad de los pueblos que han habitado y protegido la naturaleza por siglos? Sientes que algo está muy mal. Con todos los permisos aprobados de forma dudosa, el proyecto arranca con la fuerza de decenas de máquinas que entran al territorio a hacer excavaciones. Talan árboles, usan el agua del río y lo contaminan. Hay ruido hasta en la madrugada. Los hombres que eran pescadores o agricultores ahora son obreros. Las mujeres, además de tener que criar solas a sus hijos, deben realizar las tareas que antes hacían sus compañeros. No tardas en darte cuenta de que militares y hombres foráneos que llegaron a trabajar con el proyecto están acosando a las mujeres, que se convierten en las principales afectadas por lo que les vendieron como progreso y desarrollo. Quiero que trates de imaginar la indignación que te produce toda esta situación. Te diriges de nuevo a las entidades del gobierno a hacer los reclamos y además de que nunca te dan respuestas claras o soluciones, te tratan con discriminación y racismo por ser una persona del campo. Te hacen sentir ignorante en temas técnicos e insisten que por ser del campo no comprendes las bondades del proyecto. Pero tu indignación se hace más fuerte cuando descubres que esas entidades protegen los intereses del proyecto y no les importa ni la naturaleza ni los derechos de la comunidad. Cada vez son más permisivos con los proyectos de explotación y apresuran los trámites de licencias de exploración. Ahora imagina que un mal día, a causa de las operaciones del proyecto, ocurre un desastre que contamina el agua del río, matando miles de peces y otros animales. Desde ese día ya no pueden pescar y tienen que ir a los supermercados a comprar alimentos. La policía desaloja la fuerza a las familias que se niegan a entregar sus tierras para el proyecto. Los niños y las niñas se están enfermando. Descubres que no hay normas vigentes que obliguen a este tipo de proyectos a hacer estudios del impacto que tendrán en la salud humana y que, por tanto, no puedes responsabilizarlos por las enfermedades ocasionadas por la contaminación. Incluso hay funcionarios que les dicen que ustedes son unos cochinos y que por eso se enferman. No te queda otra opción que convocar una manifestación para exigir respeto por el territorio y por los derechos de la comunidad. Muchas personas se suman a la movilización para apoyar tu causa, pero el ejército y la policía reprimen la protesta de manera violenta, dejando un doloroso escenario con personas muertas, heridas y judicializadas por terrorismo. Un día sales en la televisión y la prensa como terrorista y te señalan de estar en contra del desarrollo. La estigmatización crece a tu alrededor. Ahora vives con miedo por tu vida y la de tu familia. Imagina que una noche... Una terrible noche, desconocidos irrumpen en la comunidad, entran a la casa de un líder social que defiende como tú el territorio y lo asesinan junto a toda su familia. En ese momento sientes que tu mundo se ha derrumbado. Cuando quieres denunciar, el sistema judicial y personas del gobierno te señalan de terrorista una y otra vez. Nadie te responde. Pero tú... No vas a dejar de luchar por ese territorio hermoso en el que naciste, lejos de la ciudad, un lugar lleno de vida, con bosques nativos y nacimientos de agua pura. El día a día lo pasaban entre la siembra, 
el pastoreo de animales y en el río pescando. Esta es la realidad de miles de pueblos indígenas, afro y campesinos de América Latina que enfrentan a diario el impacto de proyectos extractivos, agroindustriales o energéticos, apoyados o incluso implementados por los diferentes gobiernos de turno, sin importar su ideología política. ¿Y tú? ¿Conoces alguna comunidad en donde esto esté ocurriendo? Es como una receta un manual para la implementación de megaproyectos a través de diferentes formas de abusos de poder, a través de las normas legales, a través de los discursos, a través de la omisión institucional, a través de la fuerza física y a través de la negación de la participación y las consultas. Pero cada día son más las comunidades, organizaciones y personas en toda América Latina y el mundo que defienden sus territorios de los megaproyectos, recuperando las prácticas ancestrales del buen vivir. Allá viene la cholita, para donde irá, con su querida morada. Su falita quema, allá viene la cholita, de donde vendrá, cargando sobre su espalda, cargando sobre su espalda, su realidad, su realidad. That was an amazing, heartbreaking and inspiring um, cartoon. I think, yeah, I really think that that should be shared around more. And it's amazing after watching, after listening to stories this week and watching it, you're just like, wow, that could be any, <laughs> any of the stories that we've been hearing about. Um, and it's, yeah, a really beautiful animation. So hopefully, Lucha, we can share that around. Um, yeah, can use it in classes, show it to that uncle at Christmas that doesn't believe it. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, and now we're going to go and hear from Marisol. Um, and she can probably tell us some stories that are similar to that. Um, yeah, I'll just introduce you. Um, now you're going to have to help me with this pronunciation because Marisol is an Indigenous Mapuche Wijishi, please Wijiche. correct me. Wijiche. Wijiche. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, butchering that with my Aussie accent. Um, from the south of Ch Chile, who is currently residing in Nam in so-called Australia. Marisol is an activist who's been campaigning and denouncing human rights violations against the Mapuche and First Nations people's rights and grassroots activists in Latin America. Co-founder of LASNET, which is the Latin American Solidarity Network, and presenter of Mujeres Latino Americanas, which is a current affairs program at 3CR Community Radio. Um, Marisol is also the Latin American spokesperson for Friends of the Earth and coordinator of the Masal Exchange, which is Mapuche Aboriginal Struggles for Indigenous Land. And I've known Marisol for a few years now, and she inspires me all the time um, and I'm really excited to hear you speak some more about yeah the struggles and also the bridge building that you take part in thanks so much Marisol all right thank you so much look that sounds like a wow amazing person but I'm just Marisol and as I mentioned you know <laughs> Marisol is um is my uh, Spanish name yeah but we all indigenous we have our own names <clears throat> that at a certain point you know to be able to survive in the Chilean world in my case you need to get names proper names I'm lucky that we we were able to keep our surnames that is a good thing so um yeah yes thank you so much for the opportunity uh that again to speak I think that video definitely uh, represent what's happening to my people and many other indigenous communities around the world. And we have been listening 
uh, all the different amazing speakers from different workshops and part of the world uh, denouncing similar issues. Uh, when we talk about multinational corporations, yeah, we talk about uh, land dispossession, plant of our land, uh, displacement of the communities, uh, em environmental destruction, um, the soil became ster sterile, um, you know, the exhaustiveness, I'm not sure that's an English word, of the, you know, river banks. And of course, all this destruction led to the disappearance <clears throat> of our native um, animals and plants and herbs. You know, they are so important for indigenous people because we use them for our traditional medicine. And of course, all that is affecting the practice of, you know, the way indigenous people we live. And multinational corporations, in this case, uh, speaking about the Mapuche and other brothers and sisters, you know, um, for example, we have in Chile, we have Barry Gold, we have BHP, we have Arauco Mayeco, we have Endesa España, and I can keep going, you know, multinational corporations who are from one part of the country to the other, you know, taking all our natural resources. During this process, um, if I speak on behalf of my people, Mapuche indigenous people, um, yes, we get killed, disappear, torture, incarcerated. Uh, why? Because most of the communities don't want to move out of the land. So when you don't want to move out of the land, you know, as you saw in the video, there is a second phase. So the second phase is that for those one who don't want to follow the new project, you know, the police come to harass you, they employ paramilitary people to come and try to scare you at the beginning and after hurt some of your family members. And if that's not enough, you know, they create a situation where they make you responsible. And because it's true, the governments in Latin America, they are using the anti-terrorist law that they don't call it anti-terrorist law anymore. They call it the law, the internal law. Um, or let me translate that. The state internal law, that's the way they call it. So what it means that, that a, any person, it doesn't say that it's just indigenous people, but it's applied just to indigenous people and anarchists. So everyone else, you know, go into the normal law process. So this internal state law allows them to keep you in jail for nearly a year uh, without having a reason or proving that you are guilty because this law allowed them to, to look for proof, you know, witnesses, you know, who can say, yes, this is true, you are responsible. So that's basically the, the, the process. So they come with a new project, no consultation. And when you realize already everything has been approved, everything has been approved and they just come to evict you from your land, to plunder your land. And not, not, not to be repetitive, you know, um, to mention what other indigenous um, have been saying previously, you know, is that there is a totally different view. Indigenous view um, of the development is, is so different, you know, from the Chilean state and multinational corporations, you know, because the Chilean state and the multinational corporations, they have the development, you know, that come from the Western or the Western approach, as we call it, totally different than the way we perceive, the way we see our land. And it's terrible. Just to talk about, for example, what mining does, what forestry companies do, they do, what um, hydroelectric companies, because our land is affected by all these different multinational corporations. So with the hydroelectric companies, you know, some of our uh, sacred, you know, uh, cemeteries, you know, they are underwater now. 
So they use different mechanisms, you know, to not just to scare communities, to convince some of them that this project is good. We have forestry companies. Uh, until today, the conflict that we have, the biggest conflict that we have is, you know, how forestry companies like natural uh, native forest, you know, has been replaced by exotic, you know, a forest or whatever they want to call it. So we have pine plantations everywhere, eucalyptus plantations everywhere. And I know every time I talk about eucalyptus plantation, I know that the eucalyptus is, is so important for local indigenous here uh, in the country where I am at the moment. And, but it's not the same. The, the soil in Mapuche land, in the indigenous land, is not prepared for eucalyptus tree or pine uh, trees because we are a very rich soil. You know, so it's what, what these trees do, they go straight away to our underground water. You know, so you can see the result a few kilometers down, you know, when you start see the erosion, you know how they are drying the underground water, how they are killing, you know, the land where some brothers and sisters still live there. What we are doing to defend ourselves, the same with mining companies. With mining companies, we also are having similar issues, you know, the pollution of the rivers. But it's more than that, I will say the rights of the water. Because it's so easy for, you know, multinational corporation or uh, rich farmer to get the right to have water, but not for the people you know, who work or the indigenous people who live in those areas. So they not, they not just the pollution of the water, also the water that normally come to this area, you know, uh, from other areas of the country, you know, is very difficult for us to get access to the water. And of course, the price is very high. Don't think that they bring the water for free, no? So you have to pay for that water. So they take your water, pollute your water, they bring new water and you pay for that water. So that's the business, isn't it? We believe in building bridges and that's why I'm part of a muscle exchange because I also believe that it's important uh, to face these companies with other communities who are also affected you know, by the same multinational corporations or other multinational corporations. With muscle exchange, the idea is to, to learn from each other. So we already start this project in Mapuche land. So we were lucky to be able to bring, you know, to take with us some uh, brothers and sisters from here, from different indigenous communities in Australia to my people's land. So they had the opportunity to see how we live, to, to, to be with us when the police was coming into our land, because you know, sometimes it's so hard to believe, to say, oh no, the police come here. You know, they do two, 3 a.m. raids because they just they want it. But some people it's hard to understand that situation like that can happen for real. It's like a movie, so much violations of human rights, you know, that you cannot believe that is true. But yes, uh, our brothers and sisters, when they were with us, they had to experience, you know, what Mapuche people is every day, you know, experiencing. You know, the police coming into your land with just, you know, pretending they are in the 1800, you know, with their guns shooting around you know, trying to scare the population, uh, taking the power, you know, in some of the communities, we do have electricity and power, <clears throat> they come and boom, they boom, you know, blow the power. So situation like that, every day, every day, as a way for, you know, to, 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 to pass a message that it's time for you to move out of your land. Uh, they harass our children, 
you know, when they go to school, in the way to school, and they went back to school. They insult us, you know, so the, it's so easy for them to stand up and when you walk past to say names, to call your names. And <clears throat> But the Chilean people, most of them, they have no idea that a situation like this is happening in the areas where the majority of the indigenous people live because they believe what the media, the media who is in the hands of five rich families in Chile, <clears throat> they are the one who control the media. So they are the one who, you know, feed the Chilean population about how we Mapuches are, how bad we are, you know, uh, not letting these forestry companies, hydroelectric companies and mining companies to do their job, to bring work into the areas, you know, to bring development, you know, to the area. So besides all that, we, we, we stand up and we continue uh, fighting and organizing. And, and yeah, and we want to share that. We want to share that it's so important to unite. It's so important to, to find common grounds where you can work together. You know, besides the difference that you could have or the interest, because as activists, probably I'm more interested in forestry, probably more interested in to know campaign about, you know, hydroelectric companies or mining, you know, but for us, indigenous people is all connected. So it's not one thing different than the other because all those multinationals are affecting our land, are destroying our land. You know, we are facing a massive soil degradation because of this multinational corporation. It's so sad when we see our native forest, you know, replaced by exotic growth, you know? It's so sad not to have our plants and, you know, traditional medicines, you know, when you have a headache or tummy pain, or just to go to, you, you know, out of your home and take the herb and, you know, put it in hot water and drink it. It's so difficult, believe me, and we are so isolated because we are not talking about from here, you know, where I live in Melbourne, 10, 15 minutes walking and everyone has a car here. We're talking about kilometers distance between one community to another. So to help another community, it means, you know, hours because also we don't have cars, you know? So we need to rely on the public transport that normally is every three hours, every four hours, you have a bus if you're lucky. So it's all, all that situation, you know, but besides all that, we are still fighting. We still believe that we can continue. We can uh, win, you know, we can make these multinationals to go that, um, yeah, together we can create um, different difference. And I would like to propose that, you know, uh, I'm interested in to, in to live today, um, you know, asking for unity, asking for a real campaigns, for example, to boycott, to boycott these companies. You know, they are Australian, most of them. You know, we can boycott them. You know, we can start consuming, buying the products, you know. We can uh, pass the voice and say, okay, don't use this toilet paper because this toilet paper comes from the trees, from Mapuche land. You know, but the plantations, you know, for them to be able to produce this toilet paper, they kill, they displace, they plunder indigenous people in that area, you know? So I think it's important if we can do something similar with different communities. We have over 15 leaders in our communities, we call it way shafes, you know, in Mabudungun, that is my first language. We call them, they are killed. They were killed, but impunity, total impunity. No one is in jail or responsible for the killing of indigenous leaders. You know, so it's like a normal thing. You know, we are the troublemakers. We are the problem. And don't forget that we Mapuche people or indigenous people in Chile, we are not in the Chilean constitution. So for the Chilean government, we are not indigenous because we are all Chilean. See, so we are all Chilean, we are not indigenous. We have a different culture, we speak a different language, but for the Chilean constitution, we don't exist. You know, we are all Chileans. 
the last thing that I would like to mention is that um, water rights and mining, you know, uh, water rights, sorry, no mining, uh, is, is very important. Um, we are prepared to continue. And when I say we, I'm talking about young generations, you know, who, who are at the moment more conscious and proud to be indigenous than my generation or the generation before me. Because the generation before me and my generation, we were scared, you know, to do a lot of things. But we have new generations who are not scared anymore and they are fighting for their, you know, land and they are moving some of them back into the land. There has been two generations living in the capital cities after being displaced, but now they are moving back into the land that belonged to their ancestors. So I think that's, that's a good sign, that's important. And we will continue, you know, uh, fighting against the Chilean police in this case uh, to make sure we have our land back. And yeah, I would say that is a lot for me to say that, you know, so it's a, building bridges is essential. It's the most important thing. And Australian people are very solidarious. Is that a word in English? It's so hard, but also, you cannot find a translation for solidarious yet. So because you just we say- We understand. <laughs> no, you say solidarity, but solidarity is not solidarious. You know, it's a, it's a different meaning, but I, there is no other word in English that I can translate solidarious. But yeah, that's the way I see Australian people know everyone, but most of the activists here in Australia, they care and they're interested in to support uh, other countries' struggle. That is such a good thing, you know, that, um, but the only thing we need to, to learn to do is to work together, you see, so division doesn't help, you know, if we are all together, and that's the idea I can imagine that this blockade armor is to make sure we work together and make a massive movement denouncing these corporations, especially mining, you know, and see if that can make a difference. So I will leave it there. And um, I didn't say nothing in Mapudungun that I always said, but I will say again. So Mari Mari Lemien, Chaltumai, and Peu Thank you so much. Mari Chueo. Thank you so much, Marisol. A lot on the for everyone. Mari Chueo. Mari Chueo, Mary. A lot on the Nguyen, strength. Yeah, a lot of Nguyen, yeah, strength. Nguyen, am I saying it right? Nguyen. Yeah, beautiful. No, Nguyen. thank you so much um, for all of that. And yeah, talking about the bridges that we can build um, and that we're trying to do here. Um, Talk to mine. Um, yeah, no. I know that you just say that you're just Marisol, but you are very inspiring to, to me. So thank no, you so thanks, much. Anisa. Thank you. Um, and we would like to open up the space now for people to make comments and questions. Um, and I've just seen Tom, you wrote something in the chat. Do you want to say it to us? Give you some space all the way from the UK. Thanks for coming. Hi there, yeah. So I'm, uh, I work for an organization called Latin America Bureau. Um, I'm a, a writer, translator, and an editor. Um, and for the last few years at Latin America Bureau, we've been increasingly concerned with, well, extractivism in general, and particularly with, with issues around mining. Um, and so we're, we're launching a project now this year on community resistance to mining in Latin America. It aims to look at resistance struggles across the whole region, um, looking at the ways communities have been resisting. Also on the other side, strategies of companies, how they manage to divide communities, get a foothold in areas, their relationships with 
government and um, and the media. Uh, also things like trade deals, how companies are using these to their advantage and so on. Um, anyway, it's a big project and we're, we're fundraising for it at the moment. So um, I've put the mm. link to our crowdfunder in the chat um, and that's where you'll find all the information on the project. So please do take a look at it. And, uh, and thanks for the, the opportunity to speak about it. Yeah, thank you. Very, very on topic, building bridges and part mm -hmm. of that, I, I guess, um, gathering information. So um, that is important. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody, oh, there, there, there was a question um, that you put in, Marie, that was, Oh, are there many Mapuche political prisoners right now? So I'll, I'll send that to you, Marisol, and also just encourage anyone that, that has any questions or any comments about building bridges. This is the time for it. So go, Marisol. Uh, yes, we do. We, we have political prisoners, and um, we still have a few of them in a hunger strike. As you can see, there is no information in the media you know, so it's uh, because also um, at the moment, you know, the coronavirus is, it has been helping, you know, governments like Chile to, to keep the, continue with the repression. But now, because everyone is so scared and worried about coronavirus, you know, not many people is paying attention. So yes, we do, we still have uh, wage chaffes, you know, who are spokespersons from uh, different communities um, in jail. And we continue, you know, uh, a, a campaign that we have part of LastNet for over 25 years, you know, that is denouncing and see what we can do from here. So it's a, we have a few indigenous spokesperson who we normally interview or we meet with them. Uh, we try to do it once a week uh, to make sure that we are up to date with information. Just to mention that on the 14th of November, that is not long ago, we had another year uh, of the killing, yeah, or, you know, of Camilo Catrillanca, who was, uh, you know, we have more than uh, indigenous who have been killed, but with Camilo Catrillanca, it was the first time that we could prove that the Chilean uh, police and, uh, and the Chilean state, they were um, lying. You know, internationally, we could prove they were lying about the way Mapuche people, you know, um, have been accused of burning trucks, you know, eh, damaging and plantations and things like that. So with Camilo Catrillanca, eh, yeah, he was driving his tractor, you know, when a, a policeman decided to shut him from the back, you know, just because he wanted to do it. Simple as that, but because, you know, they, they, they were used to that that was normal and everyone will believe it. They leave it like that and they record it. They record how they killed him from the back. But this time, you know, uh, the Chilean, the Mapuche people decide to go to the street and we were lucky that most of the young people and Chilean people decide to support the action. And there were massive actions all around the country for the first time that the Chilean people and everyone mobilized, uh, you know, to the streets requesting the truth about the situation because lucky that there were other people, other Mapuche indigenous with him. So they managed to take some recording and that recording went viral about the, the, the way he was killed for real, you know? So, and yeah, so that highlight a little bit the, the Mapuche situation and that stopped the killing of indigenous leader and um but uh, yeah we are still we are still facing a, a similar situation and unfortunately as i said coronavirus is is a really good cover for the Chilean state <clears throat> thanks for that Marisol, and we have another question in the chat which says, you mentioned products sourced from the exploitation of Mapuche land that is sold in so-called Australia. Can you give us some examples of things to boycott? Start the campaign now. I'm more than happy to send that in. 
information through the chat. So you have a different toilet paper, for example, Comfort, just to mention one of them. That's a brand. In Latin America, we call it Comfort to every toilet paper because that's the most famous brand. So we don't call it paper, we call it Comfort, but that's a brand. So that's one of them. So there is a lot of uh, paper, you know, the tissues, you know, that you use to blow your nose. And, and but I'm more than happy to send the list. We still have, um, we, we started a, um, a project when we came back from the first uh, part of the exchange, because we realized that there were other Australian companies involved in Chile and um, bringing the timber to Australia. And we try, you know, all the information they have in the web page is, we can say fake or not the real, because we couldn't find where they have the office. You know, in, in some information show that they were in Sydney, we did all that research, but we couldn't find where they are in Australia. So we are in all the process to investigate and get more clear information. So that's why I'm happy to send it. Um, yeah, that would be amazing. And I'm even thinking, yeah, a list of all the companies of all of what everyone's talked about this entire week could be a really good resource that we could create um, to really draw those links together so that people have concrete examples and can go and tell their friends and family about, you know, that conversation when you're in the supermarket or whatever. So yeah, that would be really good, Marisol. We can send that out to everybody. Um, and we have a multi-part question. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll read it all out and then um, chuck it to the panelists and I guess anyone else. So Pora is still here, Ron's still here and, and Marisol. Um, so part A is, could it be that the extremely violent, corrupt, etc. Um, people are sociopaths. B, are the justice, legislative, executive and business systems protected from being led by the mentally inadequate such as sociopaths? And C, Australia talks about mental health more freely than I've seen, I'm thinking Brazil and USA do. Perhaps this is an opportunity for Australia to address such issues differently. Um, so I don't know who wants to, if anybody wants to have a go at answering that three-part question. Hello, I'm here, I'm Poro. Hey. I respond to that, just to like break the ice and everything. Um, yeah, uh, share screen, can you get, let me share screen again, please? Um, yeah, just to see like, uh, this little map that I shared before. Um, yep, you're good to share. Yeah, yeah. So transitioning regional economies uh, again in Cairns Regional Council, by Cairns Regional Council and Advance Cairns. So in here, Control F. If I do Control F again, Freeport, gold and copper company in the world. Um, in West Papua, they're actually hiring um, uh, an area in Cairns which give to Australia himself since 1974, $300 million a year. And he, this, is, um, this is the map of, yeah, I want to share again. Yeah, this is the map of it. So you can see from Cairns go to, um, wait, sorry. You can see from, wait, uh, yeah, anyway, from from Cairns to Alabo Pacific uh, in Papua, especially like to Freeport, to any other billion dollars mine sites in Papua New Guinea. And it has so much money to Australia, to Cairns especially. And like for me to see what Rio Tinto does Bougainville with like more than 20,000 people, 20,000 Bougainville and pass away plus 
any other uh, Papua New Guinean uh, indigenous that are fighting in Okitedi, especially by Rio Tinto as well. So in here, we're talking about genocide, a genocide of a race. So yes, it's it's like for me to respond to that, I, I feel like um, most of the Australian elitists and mining, um, what do you call it, conglomerates, uh, I don't know, uh, like mentally, mentally, I don't know, disabled for me, it's sociopath. Yeah, we can call it sociopath because um, they can organize a, a ticket enforcement who kill people to murder people to protect them. And they can like in, in this capitalism spectrum, there's a police who, who, who the role is to bring justice into community. But, you know, the, the truth is they, they, they literally like mafia, you know, sociopath, right? Like um, a gang a gang, but they have, you know, a uh, legal lawyer, they have, um, what do you call it, lobbies, etc., etc. So, yeah, for me, if we go back to that question again, um, we need, we need to some kind of, like, I don't know, get together to and then bring more voices to these people. So um, this type of uh, behavior and this type of um, like feeling of superiority uh, can be reduced in a way. And I feel like education's like we've been talking about uh, traditional practice for medicines and food, etc. cetera. And they had this, we never heard of this. We never heard of this until like we had a we had this like IMAC um, seminar and and then, yeah like we, we like for me it, it's it's how can I say um, if if there is a space for indigenous community that has been um, impacted by all these multi million dollars Australian companies Australian community themselves need to hear and listen. Right, so this mental illness, sociopath uh, diseases, is not easily um, what do you call it uh, uh, contracted into the Australian community. Because if you see, if you see on on like different investment project um, around uh, most most of the major major uh, industries, uh, mining industry, gas industries, um, who invest in in the in the regions in indigenous community, they don't realize that um, the, there's this big mafia, you know, the conglomerate mafia actually using um, what do you call it, a security enforcement to kill people, and then once they know, once they know, and then they regret it, they regret it, they regret it. So, um, yeah, I feel like I feel like uh, give. For point 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 C, like, uh, we need to Australia talks more about mental health more freely than perhaps than Brazil and USA. Perhaps this opportunity for Australia to address such an issue differently. Um, I would say like to reduce the mental health uh, issue here is to to give more voices to to give more voices for the community who actually impacted. Um, I, I'm not sure whether it's related, but like. Yeah, I feel like uh, elitist conglomerates, they have mental illness, yes, yes. And they didn't know like what they're committing to with the action towards the community, uh, indigenous community around the world. And we need to have that um, clarity from from what they're investing in to the community that, that you know, uh, that they, they have, they have um, invested the community to their, their um, and then for the second question, B, are the justice, legislative, executive, and business system protected from being led by the mentally inadequate, such as sociopath? I think I addressed it before, yeah, like all these conglomerates, capitalists, um, companies have billion dollars, man, billion dollars money and lobby, lobbies and uh, what do you call it? Um, they, are they have a lot of backings like in Indonesia, especially 
um, like you can see on an example, like uh, someone like um, the Minister of Fisheries is actually have a background of like five star, four stars, generals army. And in Southeast Asia, we know that Indonesian have a lot of, a lot of army, uh, like the most powerful army in the regions. So they actually lead the, the agreement to all these um, uh, oil and gas companies. So yeah, for me, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a disease that we need to fight together. Disease that, yeah, capitalism is a disease and superiority in, in race as well is a disease. And yeah, to, to fight this disease together is to give more voices for community that have been impacted by all these uh, mining company. And this is our homework for the next 100, 200 years. Um, thank you. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for the homework. <laughs> we can do it. Um, okay, so we've um, gone over time. So I think we might wrap up now. Thanks so much everyone for staying. Um, and also everyone that's watching the video after the fact. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share the screen to give you the details um, and anyone on the live stream watching of, um, yeah, if people wanna donate in solidarity with the YU affected from last week's Hurricane Lota. So earlier we had um, Sebastian who was speaking about what's been going on there. So all donations are welcome. Um, I don't know, yeah, to the Lesnet account and that, that'll be sent. Um, and that also on Sunday, December 6th, there'll be a um, open meeting to discuss better ways to support and improve solidarity with Latin American struggles. So please email lesnetsolidarity at gmail.com if you would like to come along um, so we can keep building from what we've learned this week and the relationships that we're forming. Um, so I'll just type that email into the chat so you can copy it over. Um, and yeah, thank you so much everyone for coming along. Um, it's really exciting to be able to, yeah, as Poro said, we're trying to heal the sickness by giving space to affected communities. And we're also discussing all of the different ways that we can build bridges and improve this solidarity. So thanks so much for coming along, for being part of it. And we still have three more days of this conference. So um, tomorrow th there's a bunch of really amazing panels with a lot of indigenous people from so-called Australia talking about resistance to gas um, and also about cultural heritage and extractivism at nighttime. Um, so yeah, please come along to, to those and yeah, maybe see you at Sunday at the park. We can keep planning, see each other face to face. So thanks so much. And thanks so much to the speakers. Um, it was really amazing. We leave the movie or not? No? Um, Take a minute. There, yeah. There's one more movie um, yes. that goes for seven minutes. Maybe, yeah, we can just play it and then Feel free to go off to bed. That's very, very understandable. And then it can be available on the live stream for anyone who wants to watch it. Um, it's a seven minute video about BHP in Colombia. Yep. Um, so yeah, either okay. enjoy the movie and have well, a great thank you, sleep. thank you so much for coming. Ciao, buenas noches. Um, and oh, someone's asking for the link to the animated video can we share that now or is that something we're gonna to have to email out we, we need to mail it we need to put on the web page we don't have it yet we don't have it no link we have it in a computer so okay we'll... yeah it's not linkable yet no, but yes, no, no. We we'll definitely send it out in kind yes. of follow-up we... emails and watch the lasnet website we will put it in the last youtube anyway and on the blog imr youtube too so yeah it'll it'll be spread far and wide yeah. this, this is video also was made last year, but we no 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 many people have seen it. So, <laughs> okay. Mi 
espíritu. BHP Billiton Mining Projects in Colombia. Statement to shareholders. BHP Billiton has been heavily involved in two major mining projects in Colombia over the last two decades, El Cerejón and Cerro Matoso. El Cerejón is an enormous open-cut coal mine in the province of La Ojira. BHP Billiton has jointly owned this mine since 2000 with Anglo-American and Glencore Extrata. Cerro Matoso, another enormous mining project located in the province of Córdoba and a large smelting complex to produce ferro-nickel. BHP Billiton owned Cerro Matoso outright until 2015 when it was transferred to the Perth-based company South32. Given that the same four shareholders, namely JP Morgan, HSBC, Citigroup and National Nominees, own a controlling interest in both BHB Billiton and South32, the transaction cannot properly be referred to as an arm's length sale and purchase agreement. Last year, two landmark decisions of the Constitutional Court in Colombia recognised the social and environmental catastrophes that the communities living around both mining projects are experiencing and held that mining operations have been important contributing factors to the dire conditions the communities face in each instance. Judgment 2302 of 2017 in the case of Serajon and Judgment 2 T733 of 2017 in the case of Cerro Matoso. In its 2015 annual report, BHB Billiton described the ferro-nickel complex at Cerro Matoso as the lowest cost producer of ferro-nickel in the world. It is now an undisputable fact that this has largely been at the cost of the local communities to whom all social and environmental costs have been externalised that the mining and smelting operations at Cerro Matoso have directly caused social and environmental devastation in the region, a fact that the company has consistently and vehemently denied. It was recently recognised and documented by a detailed medical study ordered by the Constitutional Court in Judgment T733 of 2017. We demand that the company doesn't attempt to use the supposed sale of Cerro Matoso as a pretext to deny their legal and financial responsibility for the ownership and management of the project over the last two decades, when most of the damage was inflicted on the communities located around the mine, mostly members of the Zenu Indigenous people. In the case of the communities affected by Cerro mostly members of the Wayu Indigenous people, we demand that the company fully cooperates with all levels of the Colombian state and most importantly, with the full participation and prior informed consent of the affected communities to implement the orders of the Constitutional Court in judgment T302 of 2017 in good faith. This includes the elaboration of immediate and long-term strategies to remedy the catastrophic social and environmental conditions the communities in the region face. A necessary step that must be taken immediately is a substantial reduction in the amount of water used by Serajon until the regional water supply shortage has been completely resolved. Many communities in the region have no water supply infrastructure at all, and dozens of Wayu children have literally died from malnutrition as a result, apart from the many thousands that are severely affected, albeit not to the point of death yet, while the company uses millions of litres of water in its daily operations on a preferential basis. Another aspect is the horrific violence that has been unleashed against community leaders in the regions where the mining projects are located over the last three decades. A ferocious and unrelenting campaign of terror and social control has been waged against community leaders in both regions, in the vicinity of Cerrojón and Cerro Matoso, respectively. In particular, against those leaders that have confronted Cerro Matoso and Cerejón and sought justice for their communities. Over 30 social leaders from the communities around Cerro Matoso alone have been assassinated in a ruthless and systematic campaign of terror, plunder and social control. The violence and attacks intensified when community leaders started trying to obtain information regarding the legal ownership of relevant properties as well as economic and environmental details about the mining projects and their impacts. 
irrespective of whether the management of BHB Billiton has directly or indirectly collaborated with the perpetrators of these attacks or not. The company and the four shareholders mentioned above in particular have been the primary beneficiary of all these developments and must recognise its responsibility and commit itself to clarifying and rectifying the situation. More generally, who are the executives that are responsible for the operations in Colombia? Can they explain how the company has managed to operate with so little difficulty in two regions where the local communities have been terrorised and disseminated by the illegal armed groups that dominate each region? Did they reach an agreement with the armed groups so that operations could continue? Or has the company actively collaborated with the armed groups and if so, to what extent? The targeted and systematic terror campaign waged against local communities attempting to confront the company strongly suggests tolerance by the company, if not some degree of collaboration in at least some of the many attacks and assassinations that have occurred. Not only have the armed groups not disrupted corporate production, they have actively deployed against opponents of or impediments to the mining projects. What has BHB Bulletin done to denounce these attacks and protect the lives and welfare of the people living in these communities? Is the company willing to participate in the ongoing Truth and Justice Commissions in Colombia to clarify what has been happening in these regions, how the violence has affected the company and what strategies have been employed to enable to continue production largely unaffected by the turmoil and rampant violence? More information from the Latin American Solidarity Network, LASNET.